you're listening to this show, chances are you're a fan of music. But what about our pets? What about the wide variety of other species that share this planet with us? Thanks to Zoo Musicology, we may soon learn more about music and animals. You're listening to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Welcome back to Music Student 101. Welcome back. It is a new year. It is a new year. Uh, Matt, are you doing anything cool and different this year? Uh, not really. <laughs> Although you started vocal lessons the last part of last that year. That was the last part of last year. That's still going on. They, they continue. Uh, they continue, learning a lot. Uh, it's, it's funny, I'm learning that if you breathe correctly and project correctly, you know, some of the things that... I always thought I was really hard, you know, belting the high notes and stuff like that. They're actually easier if you're doing them right, mm-hmm. you know, than, than they are if you're doing them wrong. So, uh huh. So I, I'm learning a lot. Yes, before I took vocal lessons, I thought the only way to hit those high notes was really just to belt it and strain. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> tighten up your throat and facial muscles and all that. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I used to do too. And it's exactly the wrong way to do it, apparently. And I would lift my head up looking up. Yeah, and, and then for the no loads, I would look down, yeah, look down, and make a make a make a angry face. I mean, yeah, yeah, and, it, <laughs> the, and yeah, right. The minute you dip your chin down, you're crimping up your whole throat and vocal cords, right? And mm-hmm. So you, yeah, cutting off your potential. Yeah, you kind of got to resist that instinct and, and just kind of keep yeah, you know, keep a good posture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, so that's that's been fun. I've been playing a lot of bass lately. Really gotten back into my bass playing, which. Uh, is is rewarding and a lot of fun, mm-hmm. you know, kind of re-obsession with my old instrument. Because, you know, I didn't play a lot when I was in when I was in graduate school and things like that. There just wasn't a lot of time. And so, I, I, yeah, I didn't play a lot of bass back then. But but now, you know, I've really gotten back into it and it's, it's uh, been really good. You know, I'm learning all sorts of new stuff and, you know, th- there's always things I can't do that I wish I could do. And, you know, I know what to do about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. You know, it's, it's just getting up the time and willpower uh, all at the same all in the same day to, to pick it up and practice. Yeah, <laughs> that's the trick. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Um. All right, now remember when not long ago we talked about a study where rats would physically respond to different tempos of music. I do remember that. I think the preference was um like between one twenty and one forty BPM range, yeah. kind of thing. Something like that. Now, we've also seen videos uh, on our news feeds of animals reacting to music in cute, amazing, and sometimes hilarious ways. Yes. Uh, you've seen the one where the guy is out in the woods with his little GoPro, and he starts playing the banjo, and this little this fox comes and hangs out and checks him out. Yeah. And then I, this other little fox comes out and checks him out. I've, I've seen a thing, too, where uh, this person is playing the violin to these elephants that they come over and sort of start swaying. Yeah. Classical yeah. musicians playing classical music. Yeah, yeah. And they're doing they, they, they lift their trunks trunks up and they kind of sway back and forth. Yeah, yeah. To the beat, to the rhythm. Yeah. Um, and what about you, Matt? Have you ever had any like uh, musical experiences with animals? Oh, I used to have a basset hound that hated it when I practiced violin. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I. I mean. Uh, bless her heart. She would see me getting it out of its case and start howling as soon as she saw me taking it out. You mm-hmm. know, I didn't even have to play a note. She would just say, oh, isn't the minute she even saw the thing. You I'm f- like, I'm like, geez, everyone's a critic. Furry <laughs> little critic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've, all, I've spoken in the past on this show about how I've written a little jingle for just about every one of my pets, you know? Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> in my mind, I'm sure they recognize it. But do they? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, who knows? You know, we know that people use tones to call their dogs and cats back to the house. They do that. You know, Fluffy. What is that? Na, na. So, uh, na, sounds na, like maybe a major third. Major third? Yeah. Yeah, major third. There you go. Yeah, exactly. And we know that people use pitch variation when communicating with their animals. You yeah. Know? Outside? You want to go outside? You're right. Yeah. But I, think, t- I think they respond to that more than the actual words. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. So um, we're going to get a little bit into that, how animals respond and react to music in yeah. this episode. But of course, first, we're going to get into our social section here. Okay, excellent. 
Now, Matt, uh, before you read this, let me say. <laughs> Uh-oh. If we got nothing but bad reviews, I probably wouldn't read any of them on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but it's been three years since we had our last one-star review. In fact, we've been doing this since 2016, and we've only had that one bad review. Uh, the, the crashing into the pole guy. The crashing into yeah. the pole guy. Yes. And uh, that was three years ago, and we've been joking about it ever since. You know? Yes. Yep. But, uh, and we started off the new year of 2019 with a bad review. And here we are three years later. It seems only fit. It seems only fitting. Did we get a bad one? Uh-oh. Yes, we did. So oh, no. I wanted to save it, but I'm going to bring it over to you, Matt. Okay. All right, stand by. I didn't want you to read this ahead of time. I get your response, your natural response. My natural response. Okay. All right, hold on. Let me get, let me get back in my chair. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. I found, uh, unfortunately, on, on uh, Apple iTunes, the second from the most prominent review is the one you're about to hear. Okay. Matt. Okay, so one star from actually a musician. <laughs> mm. uh, if you have to go around calling yourself actually a musician, okay, uh, never no, mind. No, no, no. We'll, we'll edit that part. Well, we will have, we'll share no rancor. This is a learning experience. Okay, a learning experience. Okay, uh -huh. all right. No ears, uh -huh. no real knowledge. Uh -huh. Oh, no. Okay, well, and, and uh, actually musician says, misquoting the opening of Beethoven's Fifth <laughs> and very egregiously. With a question mark. <laughs> Did I miss? No, we'll I mean, get that's in, we'll, it, we'll right? Get, we'll get into that. Yeah, no, 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 you that's didn't. It. Uh, okay, I all went right. back and listened to this episode, but carry on, carry okay, on. Okay, all right, all right. And trouble finding the notes by ear to the opening of Haydn's surprise symphony. Well, yeah, I, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll own that. Yeah, so I, I'm sure I did that. Uh -huh. um, and you are teaching music? Yeah. Teaching in all caps. Teaching in all caps? Are you, and you are teaching music? I know, right? Mm -hmm. Scary, mm -hmm. terrifying prospect. Mm -hmm. At least do your own homework. <laughs> <laughs> I could do my own homework. Me too, me too. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Then there's one more line. There's one more thing they say. Uh, nothing wrong with your ideas. Well, good. Hey. Well, okay. At least we ended on a on a, on a semi-encouraging note there. See how uh, they close this. it? Yeah, nothing wrong with your ideas. It's like an open-faced criticism sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, that's yeah. me too, honestly. I, I, I went back. I know the episode he's talking about. It was the one we did on you know theme and variations and how to tweak melodies. It was yeah, like yeah, two yeah, episodes okay. ago. And no, I mean you did, da, 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 and that was the that was the whole that was that yeah. was the theme we were talking about. Yeah. And then maybe okay, so it took you a second to to get this hiding thing down. Now I could have gone back and edited that out, right? <laughs> but <laughs> it made me look much better. Yeah. yeah. Maybe 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 avoided this criticism, but at the same time, you know how I used to like edit out all the coffee sips and the paper drinks and the ice, cra you know? See? Uh huh. I might keep that in my mind, not because I like the idea that we feel like we're just normal people talking, you know. We are just normal people talking, honestly. And we're not, we are not here to teach music. We're, to, we're kind of more teaching music theory, you know what I mean? We're not, we're not here to show you how to play the surprise symphony. God's sake, let's hope not. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. But anyways, uh, the, the point being, I mean, I could, I just, you know, I, I don't mind us sounding... Imperfect. Uh, yeah, and we are definitely imperfect. In my in my own defense, I don't exactly sit around listening to the surprise symphony every day. It, you know, that's one of those that guy I kind of had to pull from the catalog. Yeah. You know, maybe I should probably be a little more prepared when I do that. But you know what? <laughs> yeah. But hey, we'll start the new year with a bad criticism, and then maybe I'll try and keep that in mind as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you, actually, a musician, we for your feedback, for your honesty and your feedback, for, for your honesty and feedback. We do we do appreciate honest opinions. Uh, they misspelled surprise and they misspelled symphony. <laughs> this was not. I was. I copied and pasted this, Matt. <laughs> but but, so, but we're not. We're, we're not going to. We're not going to get into that though. No, <laughs> we're, we're not. We're not going to. We're not going to harp on that. The yeah. only reason I pointed out is because they were pro obviously so irritated and so frustrated <laughs> right. that they could even spell check rage themselves. typing. Rage typing. <laughs> 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 so we hate that we invoked rage typing in anybody. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we've got people rage typing, crashing into poles. This is. Really? This is a dangerous podcast, dangerous. man. We're menace to society. But. He said music theory was a safe place. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. You guys know what to do. Give us some good reviews so that we can bury that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so we can bury that one a little bit. <laughs> 
I don't know. I wonder sometimes if negative reviews don't actually make people want to listen to it just as much as positive reviews do. That one probably would. Yeah. You know, because I, yeah. Have you ever seen a bad review of a movie and thought, well, I got to go see if it's really as bad as this person mm-hmm. <clears throat> says it is, you know? And they rarely are. Yeah, right. You know. Hey, critics going to be critics. Uh, yeah. They will know. critique. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm I'm sure I misquoted Beethoven. It's probably he's probably talking about not the not the opening, but you know when I went into which oh yeah I, which yeah I'm yeah one hundred percent trying to do by ear slash memory slash you know my horrible piano skills, and I'm sure I messed that up terribly. Yeah, still wouldn't call it egregious. Well, uh, you know. Anyway, they might not have heard the episode. This uh, actually a musician might not have heard the episode where you said that you weren't the best piano player. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I Well, yeah. For all listening, I am not a pianist. Uh, so You said it in the same episode he's talking about, though. So Yeah. yeah. I, I, I say he it or often. She, he or she. Yeah. We should they. move on. I think we, we should, should move on. on. Let's, let's move on. Okay, moving on. We got ourselves a new Patreon patron. A new Patreon patron. Excellent. Matt, please. So, uh, Joanna Baum Mm -hmm. from San Francisco Mm -hmm. writes, I just started taking piano lessons at the ripe old age of 37. (laughs) Uh, I mean, honestly, that puts you at the younger end of the spectrum of our listeners, honestly, I think. Please do not feel bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I really wanted to better understand some of the theory things my teacher mentions. Thanks for all the effort you put into the podcast. I find it so incredibly useful and torment all my non-musician friends by recounting the things I learned from it. I love that. I love that. Torment away. I, I, I torment non-musicians on a daily basis. So. Uh, torture is a big part of music theory. <laughs> Practically endemic to the concept, yeah. so We talk about torture a lot, almost more than I'm comfortable with. <laughs> Uh, and if you want to uh, join Joanna and uh, patron us on Patreon, you can do so, can't you? Yes, you go to patreon.com slash musicstudent101, and uh, you can sign up you, for a dollar to a couple of dollars a month. You can get in access to the site and check out all the bonus content. We have bonus content. Uh, for $3 you, uh, a month, 3 to $4, you can get a mug, a cool get little Get a really mug. cool little thermos thing, yep. Along with the access, all these things built. Right, these right. These are stackable things here. And then for $5 or more a month, you can actually request your own special bonus episode. Yes, where well, we will spend at least 15 minutes mm-hmm. uh, uh, answering your music theory questions specifically mm-hmm. on a Patreon bonus. And you get access to all the other uh, specific questions that we have so answered. And the coffee mug. And if you don't want a coffee mug, we also have these cool little Music Student 101 uh, notebooks that we will sign and write a nice yes, little message we do. to you. And we have merch now too, don't we? We do on redbubble.com slash Music Student 101. Yeah, Stickers, some really cool t-shirts lamps, and stuff. shower yep. curtains, yeah. anything. Everything. I think that's what I'm going to do this year, get myself a Music Student 101 shower curtain. That sounds great. That'll be my 2023 thing to do. <laughs> But anyways, we want to thank you, Joanna, uh, for supporting us and for the nice message. And we hope to join you on your musical journey. Absolutely. Now we have, uh, moving on, we have ourselves a listener mail. I'm letting Matt read all this stuff because I'm going to be doing a lot of yammering this episode. <laughs> this, is, this is a big Jeremy episode, so. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, so we have a, a listener mail from a listener named Severin Mortensen. Indeed. Let's, uh, let's hear what they had to say. All right. Uh, hello, Matt and Jeremy, fellow bassist here. Have we mentioned on this podcast that we're bassists? Uh, this person must have heard that at some point. I, I guess, yeah. Maybe that's come up once or twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, fellow bassist here, recently found out about the show and am plowing through it at a steady clip. I am probably like a lot of your listeners. I took AP Music Theory, more or less up through secondary functions and tonal harmony. Oh, that's pretty mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. In high school and played a bit, but my aural skills were and are pretty terrible, and I ended up going to college for a non-music degree. Uh, I don't think anybody is super confident about their aural skills. I told them that, especially yeah. right out of high school. Especially right out of high school, but even you know, even me sitting here, you know, I always feel like my aural skills could be better than they are. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a skill you have to develop and work on. Oh, yeah. Your whole life, right? And if you keep working on it, they'll be better tomorrow than they were today. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, recently I have been rekindling my interest in music and composition. I have been trying to build up my ear skills and I'm wondering if there's a particular order that's the most effective or if I should just try to throw myself in the deep end. Mm -hmm. I have been using the Perfect Ear app and its training exercises 
uh, is broken up in the following ways. Uh, interval exercises, scale exercises, chord exercises. Mm-hmm. I am honestly still getting the hang of matching a given pitch, so I don't want to put the cart too much before the horse here, but it seems like I would benefit from doing scale singing once I start getting the pitch matching down. Anyway, loving the show so far. Thanks a lot, Severin Mortensen. All right, all right. Yeah. So, like I said, when I wrote back, I told him, yeah, that's that's way too young to be worried about oral skills. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. time to be, yeah. Oral I mean, skills can be... You're never too young to start, but yeah, the, you're always too young to give up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well put, man. So they were asking about this question uh, mm-hmm. as far as the order. And I, it's to me, it seems like it's pretty much in line with what we've been doing. Interval, learn the intervals, learn the scales, learn the, then learn the chords. And it, it, it's, it's pretty in line with uh, sort of the pedagogical conventional wisdom of ear training, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, should you do it in a different order? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the, the most basic exercise that everybody starts learning is... is Learning the intervals, you know. Mm-hmm. What interval was that, right? In, in Major third. Uh, very nice. Thank yes, you. it was. And then, you know, yeah. And, and, you know, that's a perfect fifth. And everyone, and apps like, uh, uh, apps like this one, a perfect ear and. Better ears. Yeah. Yeah. All of, you know, they all have exercises where they're just playing random intervals and you have to guess which one it is. Mm-hmm. Um, that is extraordinarily useful in a lot of contexts. Mm-hmm. I have found that when you try to then say, okay, now let's listen to this melody mm-hmm. and listen for the intervals in this melody, mm. uh, sometimes you get into this thing where that's really not how our brain works. Right. You know, and, and I, I've had students that are sort of mentally trying to say, Okay, well, that was a major third up, and then a perfect fourth down, and then a major second up, and then a major third up, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and yeah. and that's just kind of not how our brain works. A little cumbersome. Yeah. Um, it's not that that's not important, mm-hmm. right? I mean, all, cause, there's all different approaches. Yeah, because, I mean, if, you, you know, if you're trying to orally analyze... Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, per, that first octave interval, being able to hear that's an octave... Stro- very, very useful, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, it, you can rely on that too much. And it, this is why it's important to go on to, to scales and things. Um, it really just it depends on what your end goal is, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I, I think the order is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, just understand that you're not, uh, you know, um, you're not done training your ear once you can map out every single interval, right? Once the you order is fine the, once you progress. Once you, you know? cross it off the checklist, that's not. There's more work to do to do with it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's not necessarily, in my mind, anyway, a uh, a question of skipping around. You know, I mean, really, really, you can do these in any order. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the it's is a matter of sort of hitting everything. And then hitting everything enough so that the connections start to be made in your brain, mm-hmm. you know. And then you can start dictating melodies, you know. And and it's um, it's okay. I've I practiced intervals. I've practiced scales. You know. Now melodies are just you know things that are made out of scales, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and you know, well, uh, chord progressions, you know, are you know sequences of these chords. But again. You know, when you talk about chord progressions, you're also talking about function. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily the case that, well, you know, I'm going to hear this chord, then that chord, then this chord, then that chord. You know, again, that's not necessarily the way our brains work mm-hmm. um, uh, when we're trying to dictate these things out. The way you get to that point where you can dictate a chord progression or dictate a melody effectively is when you've done these all enough that, that you sort of made the neuron connections in your brain and then you can move ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, then, then you can advance forward and, and start <clears throat> uh, talking about actual music in context. Right. And there's a few little tricks that can help you take that step too. You know, the, the trick of being able to keep do in the back or, or scale degree one, how that sounds in the back of your mind no matter what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, the trick of listening for uh, chromaticism. Which will tell you whether you've heard a, a two six or a five six five a five or a German augmented six or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a that's more of a question of a chromaticism than I know what that chord sounds, right? Sure. And, and we've got we've got all sorts of uh, 
uh, ear training episodes where we kind of step through this. Um, Absolutely. Melody and harmony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, um, if you're asking my advice, I would say the order is fine. Just progress through the order, understanding that you're working towards a goal of better ears here. Yeah. I concur. Yeah. Well, there you go, Severin. Thanks for writing in. We always enjoy engaging with our listeners. Indeed. And oftentimes you have great questions that other listeners probably could benefit from the answers. Yeah, and, you know, since we started off with a bad review, uh, <laughs> we, you know, we have had people say, you know, the, the social part at the beginning is a little long. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've had people express the feelings of, you know, get to the subject matter of the show, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, not much, but we, we've had that a little bit. And, and the reason we continue to do this is because there is actually good, important musical knowledge that comes out in you know what our listeners write to us right? i yeah. think so yeah we're not just we're not just stroking our own egos here you know no. we're actually trying to yeah uh trying to further the general music conversation not just the specific subject of this episode right? although joanna did give us a nice palate cleanser after that review i think very nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so keep sending the good reviews but don't shy away on the bad reviews don't don't shy away yeah All right, you ready to get into this episode? Let's do it. I've been kind of looking forward to this for a long time, actually. Um, And I would quote my sources right about now normally, but there's too many spoiler alerts within the sources, right? Okay, right, right. So let's just get right into it. Let's just get right into it. Let us begin. Um, I want to bring up, first of all, a word, a term. Okay. Uh, Some people might be familiar with it, but what does it mean, Matt, to anthropomorphize something? That means to make it. Or to give it human qualities. Yes. So, you know, if you're anthropomorphizing your car, for example, you you think of it, you, you give it a name, mm-hmm. you know, you think of it as being tired or, you know, ne- uh, needing a drink if, if the water is low or something like that, you know, you are assigning human qualities to, to your car and you know, that is anthropomorphizing. We do this with our cars. Mm-hmm. We do this with our deities. We do this with our musical instruments, for we, sure. We do this with our musical instruments. Cleve Lucille, our, for example. Lucille, our, our bass teacher, Cleve, named his bass Lucille. Uh, but we also do this with our, our little fuzzy friends, you know? We do indeed. Maybe a, a lot. Po- Maybe more than anything. It's like uh, you put a green sweater in your dog. Hey, my dog likes this, but they really like the pink one better. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure your, your dog doesn't really have an opinion. Or maybe you're a big fan of the Almond Brothers, and because you listen to it so much, you just think your dog is also an Almond Brothers fan. So you put a little bandana on it, right? And some yeah, sunglasses. And... Mm-hmm. But that's not exactly what we're talking about here. Um, while it's true that humans and animals use a lot of elements that we consider musical for communication, pitch, you know, loudness, tempo, timbre, right. timbre. Yep. These elements may stand alone in the bigger musical picture. Right. However, music seems to be a universal language among humans from culture to culture and region to region. Mm-hmm. Um, before we met, before we started crossing the oceans, we, all these separate cultures had their own music, you know. And many, and all cultures have a music of some sort. And uh, today, you know, yeah, totally. And some scientists are trying to determine if this language can be shared among species, which is a fascinating idea. The idea of music uh, of music as a common language mm-hmm. is one of those things that people push back on a lot. Mm. You know, the, the biggest argument that I've heard is that these different musics from this from these different cultures are so radically different that how can you possibly call them a common language? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not ready to give up on the notion myself, personally, <laughs> frankly. Nor um, am I. You know, because e- e- even if they are very radically different, and they certainly are, um, there's something about the idea of organizing sounds as a way to express something uniquely human that, that seems to just be taken for granted. Uh, that, that almost every human on the planet does this and relates to this. Mm-hmm. That, that there's some kind of commonality there. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess maybe people push back on the idea of language. Mm-hmm. You know that, that uh, you know music is a common language. People push back on the idea of music as language in general and as a common one. Mm-hmm. Certainly, maybe that's the word that that bothers people. Yeah, maybe that's the wrong word. Yeah, but but music <clears throat> is common to is common to humans in my experience. Of course, of course. You know, even Charles Darwin speculated that um, all in the animal kingdom may share the ability to perceive rhythm and melody. Music. Really? That's mu- and that's music, basically. Yeah, no, I didn't know that. No, I, I didn't, didn't know either. that Charles Darwin speculated on... So that's that's interesting, is it not? It is. And we'll get into evolution a little bit later on, because yeah. I really think that's how music came to us eventually. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
Another thing we're going to talk about, or another thing that's really what we're talking about in this episode, this is called, uh, and this is a new term to me as well, zoo musicology. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the study of the study of musical culture and species. The study of music nature, uh, the, the musical nature of sound and communication as it is perceived and produced by animals. Okay. And uh, that's kind of what this episode is really about. Yeah. See, they could have played it safe and, and called it zooaudiology or something like that and left the, left the M word out of it. Uh-huh. But, but uh, these people are bold here. So I, I love it. I love it. I love it. So let's see here. Um, I started doing research for this and um, in my limited knowledge of what I, I knew, apes, uh, chimpanzees, uh, you know, dolphins, the primates and animals that we consider to be smarter yeah. compared to the rest had some kind of musical connection. But there's so much more. Didn't, didn't, didn't Lucy, was it Lucy that was that, that famous, famously intelligent ape? Didn't didn't she play a guitar or a bass or something for a little bit? There's a video that uh, that I watched actually before this episode uh, with Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, and the the monk, the ape was Coco or Coco. Uh, that's right. Yeah, Coco, Coco the gorilla. Yeah, and yeah, sure enough, uh, Coco is fascinated with this bass and it, it holds it and keeps on plucking the string. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Flea's like, "Oh, really good job, Coco." <laughs> you know, it's so sweet and so yeah. cool. Yeah, Coco. I can't believe I can't believe I forgot the name of that ape. Yeah. That was you know, too far off. <laughs> Lucy's not a crazy ape name. <laughs> Lucy, well, I think Lucy was the first. That was a the chimpanzee. oldest first human skeleton found by oh, archaeologists. Yeah. They named it Lucy, right? There you go. Yeah, I've got too much information in my brain, but random places. Yep. But I Some think it's misfiled. We're gonna try and get as far as we can in this episode, um, and we're gonna start under the sea. Under the sea. <laughs> Take it from me. Okay, all right. Anymore and we'll get sued. So continue, please. It's funny. It's funny you seeing that because um, you know we saw the little creatures breaking out in song and raging on the seashells and the Little Mermaid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now that might not have been entirely accurate. Right. Yeah. You know. However, in 2013, a study revealed uh, in the Behavioral Processes Journal, Processes Journal, showed that fish can tell the difference between Bach and Stravinsky. Fish. Wow. Goldfish, mind you. Goldfish. Not dolphins. Goldfish. Goldfish can tell the difference between Bach and Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. Or in this in this study, I'm not talking about going out in the wild here. Right. Yeah. But but uh, Kazutaka Shino, Shinozuka, mm. a researcher at the Keio University of Japan, and his team trained one group of fish by playing different Bach pieces as they fed on a food filled ball. Uh huh. So they were trained to eat when they heard Bach. Okay. In the same setting. Only changing the music to Stravinsky, no, right. one, no one ate. Okay. They play Bach, the fish eat. Stravinsky. They play Stravinsky, they don't do anything. Nothing. So, Matt, <laughs> first off, now, I think it's kind of funny when people say classical music, okay, because you can, there's way mellow classical music. Yeah. And when you think about cats like Stravinsky, there's mm. way less mellow. It is an umbrella term for an enormous body of musical repertoire. Absolutely. So, real quick, Bach versus Stravinsky, if you're a fish. If you're a fish, or, or if you're me, <laughs> um, Bach versus Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, if you're a human music lover, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If, I mean, if you're asking me to compare and contrast the two composers, is that is that what's going on? Just as a listener, not as a, as a theorist, not or a fish, or a fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all right. So, um, Johann Sebastian Bach is the great grandfather of the tonal harmony system, mm -hmm. which uh, evolves out of the tonal counterpoint system, uh, the system by which there are a very strict set of laws governing how, how notes play together and how they're played against each other and how uh, melodies in, in different ranges, soprano, alto, tenor, ba tenor bass, uh, go together and create, uh, create chords out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then create function and the very strict rules that that uh, that govern how they do that resolution of dissonances and all that. We did three whole big episodes on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bach is the you know uh, the progenitor of this. So he is a uh, he is a very tonal harmony composer. Mm -hmm. Keys, you know, the key of G minor. Yeah, you know, um, 
uh, chords that you'll understand, you know, G minor chords and A major chords and all the others, right? You know, chords like that that you'll understand. You know, mm-hmm. Stravinsky, by contrast, uh, really not interested in that whole tonal harmony system. Uh huh. So he does things like he'll layer one chord uh, on top of a completely different chord. Kind of, kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Polytonality. Polytonality. Uh, octatonic eight note scales. Uh, um, very, very dissonant, and those dissonances are unresolved, which is cardinal sin in the tonal harmony of Bach. Right? <laughs> Bach never left a dissonance unresolved, not once in four hundred and fifty. Con- yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. So um, you know, and Stravinsky is from the twentieth century when all this kind of experimentalism is is. Uh, a really big deal, and and yeah, so there uh, he is very dissonant, very raucous, uh, very um, uh, what's the word? Unconventional. Unconventional, yeah, very and very experimental. Whereas Bach is, you know, Bach, you know, Bach is the kind of stuff you'll hear in elevators, and you know, he played by the rules because he kind of wrote the rules. Well, he wrote the rules. <laughs> yeah, they were his rules. Yeah. He, he just did his thing. Did we his we decided thing. later that what he did was the rules, <laughs> but but yeah. But I guess I guess maybe what they're going for was just finding two versions of classical music, which one was more very very different from the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. one being opposite ends of the spectrum, probably more dissonant, and um, when the other one being probably more less dissonant. I yeah, guess, in general. Yeah. Um, well, they did another experiment where they would play Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Oh. Uh, Yeah, Something like that. When the fish were at one side. Actually, musician has me worried that I don't play these things right anymore. Oh, so. it's okay. They know what you're talking about. We know what you're talking about. Actual musician knows what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they would do that when the fish were at one side of the tank. And then when they are at the other side of the tank, they would play the Rite of Spring. And then Which the, I cannot play. It's, But you can kind of, it's like really kind of... It's, I don't remember the actual chord, but it's something very dissonant but like it's that. very jarring and very dissonant. Yeah. And then when the fish were in the middle of the tank, they had silence. You know? uh-huh. So after measuring and calculating time spent on both sides of the tank, they were able to conclude that fish didn't seem to have a preference. <laughs> I mean, first off, to me, this is kind of comedy, right? Yeah. Because fish, to me, just, uh, they're probably just randomly swimming around while these people are trying to watch them and play music, you know? Yeah. I don't know if it was one fish or a little school of goldfish. And, and, yeah, and how 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 well did you control for all the external factors? You know, was the light brighter on one side or the other, or you know? I'm sure they try and as scientists, I'm sure they try and keep everything. They try to do as much eliminate as, possible, as many yeah. variables as possible. I just thought it was funny, and also um, seriously, you know, um, Toccata and Fugue and the Rite of Spring of all things. Yeah. Poor fish. Poor fish, yeah. These are go- these are going to be some some stressed out fish, I tell you. How about like the Moldau or Brahms lullaby <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> Maybe that's why they liked it better in the middle. <laughs> Maybe so. Well, they didn't seem to have a preference. They just kind of swam as they do. They just kind of they, they just kind of did their fish thing. It's not like they heard Bach and were like, "Oh, let's go over there." Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just didn't care. Yeah. Or they want to spend more time on the Bach side. Yeah. But either way, let's go a little deeper, shall we? Let's do. Whales, Matt. Whales. You know, because the underwater environment dampens the stimuli from a few key senses, mm-hmm. sound is very important underwater. I, I can imagine. You know, light falls off very quickly beneath the water's surface and completely falls away at a certain point. Right. Uh, so sight only does so good. Right. Sure, we know that sharks can detect blood from 100 meters away at concentrations of one part per million. Isn't that just terrifying? It's terrifying, but those molecules diffuse very slowly in water. Right. Depending on the current, but still very slowly. Meanwhile, sound actually travels four times, nearly four times faster underwater than it does above the surface at sea level. Okay. So we're talking like 1,500 meters per second. Wow, that's fast. Uh, It has been documented, especially among the humpback whales, that uh, the the males use their whale song to signal their virility. Uh Uh-huh. Sperm whales and dolphins use clicking sounds in different combinations of rhythmic patterns to identify each other. Mm-hmm. And also to relay other information, and then these clicks and sounds are also used for echolocation. You know, mm-hmm. um, identifying other fish that they might can eat or they might eat them. Yeah, you know, I I heard a thing once. Um, the, they they think these whales can actually convey some pretty complex emotions in, mm. in these songs. You know? Mm. you know, feelings of loneliness or you know nostalgia. Even they can really sort of have little. 
whale conversations from like miles away and it's uh it's not as easy for us to study them <laughs> you right know? yeah they, they do have a hydrophone which is an underwater microphone right right and it does pick up amazing quality you can hear these it sounds like there's echoes involved when you yeah hear it. it's really weird it's very interesting um but uh, let's see here oh so anyways back to the echo location the higher frequency sounds give off more information mm -hmm. on their return but at shorter distances i see so they'll use lower clicks to determine further distances yeah. higher clicks to the here and now right right you yeah know what i mean the whale song of the humpback whales and some blue whales like the ones you've heard on your favorite you know new age relaxation tape yep yep so whale song these are very complex and often used for mating purposes right yeah but year round they use whistles clicks grunts barks snorts and calls for all different purposes huh. for example the mama whales will make cooing sounds as they play with their calves and sometimes male whale songs will attract other male whales with typically non-aggressive results. So maybe they're just vibing on the groove. Oh, man. You know? Science has no empirical evidence to suggest that. But anyways, the whale songs have been structurally analyzed and can be broken down into phrases, subphrases, and repetitions thereof, much like our own music. Interesting. Uh-huh. Dig this, man. So they'll repeat a certain phrase containing a collection of subphrases for about four minutes. Okay. And then we're going to call this a theme. Okay. And then a collection of these, th these themes we call a song, a whale song, which can yeah. last up to 30 minutes. Wow. So when they're done with that, they repeat the whole thing over again for hours, sometimes days. In, in the exact same order and everything? Very, very much with little variation. Wow. And then whales in the surrounding area will sing, this, sing the same songs with little variation. Yeah. Repeating, singing back and forth together. I don't think I could do the same set of phrases for 30 minutes and then repeat it with little variation. I, mean, I know. <laughs> but, there, you know, maybe you have, you have a lot more distractions in your mind. You might have a, yeah. more of a monkey mind than these whales do. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of that really intelligent ape and not confuse it with the, first, with the oldest human skeleton found. And, you know, <laughs> there you go. But um, another cool thing is these songs will change and evolve over time, like yeah. any good jam session. Yeah. So maybe after day two, they threw an extra little... <laughs> you know click in there or something <laughs> um but an interesting thing is over the past 50 years science have noticed a progressive drop in frequency from the blue whale songs hmm. robert Dizyak, lead researcher for a study out of oregon state university poses one theory that due to the ever-growing and permeating sounds of the commercial fishing industry mm -hmm. whales are adapting to a different channel so to speak with less tactic less less, less sort of noise static yeah yeah so um so while they're, they're trying to find a frequency that is not as much interrupted by the sounds of these boat motors and stuff right, like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. they're actually lowering their pitches to a lower range. Wow. So their songs are evolving to the world that is coming upon them. That's, that's cool. Uh, we're not, we're not going to have time to get into birds, but that's, right. an, that's another thing. Where birds who live in the city, urban birds. Yeah, I've heard that. Scream louder. and have, they're Actually, some of them are having pro, you know, vocal. <laughs> starting to have vocal issues. Yeah. So anyways... I just thought that was interesting, the whale song concept, you know, Absolutely. and the way it's all kind of structured into a theme. It does seem very, yeah, you know, uh, it, it does seem very rhetorical, very linguistic. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard in my mind to make the step in calling it musical. Mm hmm Because to me, then you've got to define what, what is music, and, and, you know, that's that's a podcast in and of itself, right? What, what is the difference between... Hey, ask John Cage. Ask John Cage Ask indeed. John Cage. Well, he, had, he had some real good ideas about that. Whale song is way more musical than a lot of the stuff John Cage did. <laughs> he got a lot of accolades for his work. <laughs> Am I wrong? Uh, I mean, it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> uh, John Cage's philosophy was that all sound is music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There yeah, you go. And, and what he was trying to get you to understand it was that even, even intentionally random sounds can be perceived as musical mm -hmm. and you know i mean he was a big buddhist you know and, and so he, he was trying to get you to, to to appreciate you know the 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 quality of all sound and the musicality of all sound i love it yeah i love it yeah he's a lot easier to take when you when you understand the philosophy behind what he's trying to do i think when people don't understand the philosophy behind john cage i think they imagine him as this you know, sort of pretentious, sort of avant-garde person, right? You know, that's uh, 
yeah, the, the so so far off into his his own head, he's he's, he's kind of left behind something fundamental, and and you know he, he's just uh, he he's just torturing you. But <laughs> yeah, but but when you understand what he's really trying to say, it, it's it's a lot easier to sort of you know relax into his idea. I don't get it. I can turn on a tea kettle. I could use the toaster. <laughs> exactly. I could throw a fish on a piano strings. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and of course you can. You yeah, know. of course I can. Uh, the you know the idea is is, is not that th- this is special. In fact, John Cage's idea is that this is not special. This is the ordinary world we live in. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the ordinary sound world that we live in, and it's beautiful. That's what he's trying to get you to understand. Mm-hmm. Our fish friends might not appreciate John Cage as much because of the death of the tuna. <laughs> Let's get back to our fish friends, shall we? But yeah, but we digress. But we digress. You know, uh, other sea creatures that rely heavily on sound are dolphins. Music is a fairly new approach in our communication with dolphins, but prior studies have proven them to be highly intelligent, quite friendly, and even fascinated with us. You know what I mean? Yeah, fascinating. They chase away schools of dangerous sea creatures as they near us. Mm -hmm. They have served in our navies in minesweeping and in the recovery of lost swimmers and equipment as far back as the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. I did not know. I did not know that either. Many studies based on brain mass to body mass ratios as well as cognitive functions suggest that the dolphin brain is closer to ours than most others in the animal kingdom. I think I've heard that before, yeah. Now, in July of 2022, a study was published in the Journal of Applied Animal Behavior Science from the researchers out of the University of Padova in Legnaro, Italy. Mm. They found that compared to other things dolphins were known to respond to, such as recordings of falling rain or natural environments up on video walls. Mm. Classical music from Bach, Beethoven, Saint-Saëns, and Debussy, just to name a few, resulted in a greater number of social affiliative behaviors. Uh-huh. This is stuff like uh, touching each other gently, swimming closer to each other for longer periods of time, swimming in sync. This is like dolphin social behavior. That, yeah. That they're noticing for greater periods of time during and after. Their so listening. they would engage in more social behavior mm. when listening to these composers. And in the time following. And, and, and afterwards. They had eight dolphins that were studied uh, before, during, and after each 20-minute session of exposure to these stimuli for a seven-day period. Mm-hmm. So maybe for seven days, for 20 minutes, they'll let them hear falling rain. Mm-hmm. Next week, they'll do a video screen with, like, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then they'll do a week of 20-minute sessions with the uh, classical music. And it turns out, like I said, they saw more results with the classical music compared to even no music at all. Wow. You know. Dr. Cecil Guarano suggests uh, because the way the dolphins vocalize, they may have an understanding of rhythm. Mm. If you've ever seen dolphins swimming in sync together, it really kind of looks like they're dancing. Sure. You know, so there's this whole synchronization thing going on. Yeah. Let's step ashore, shall we? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Segway. Nice. Dogs. Dogs. Let's do some domestic pets. Let's do some, do some domestic animals here. <clears throat> yep. Did you? Ever... I know my dog hated my violin playing. You had I a basset could... hound. A basset hound. What yeah. was his name? Her name was Bell. Her name was Bell, huh? Yeah. That was the last. Was that the last pet you had? Uh, no. The, uh, this was uh, uh, this was when I was a teenager slash young adult. Mm-hmm. So. Um... But uh, yeah, very, 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 very intelligent, very smart dogs, basset hounds. Mm-hmm, yeah, very yeah. emotional dogs, oh, yeah. basset hounds. You know, great, make great pets. Apparently, music critics also. Oh, she hated my violin playing. That's for sure. <laughs> well, let's talk more about dogs. Okay. There was a study in 2012 published by Colorado State University in the Journal of Veterinary Behavioral uh, Sciences mm-hmm. that involved 117 shelter dogs. Mm. They are monitored for activity levels such as vocalizations and body movements. Mm. They found that most of the dogs slept better and longer to the sweet sounds of classical music compared to heavy metal, uh, which had the tendency to induce body shaking and other signs of nervousness. Huh. In this way, in my opinion, dogs and humans display similar reactions to both genres. <laughs> Don't you? I mean, now heavy metal doesn't make me shake and get nervous, but it makes me. It doesn't make me want to lay down and chill. No. It amps me up a little bit. I'm just wondering, is there is there any study where heavy metal music is going to come out good? I mean, you know, all the 
the the baby Mozart tapes and the plant studies and everything. Is is there nothing where heavy metal music? I mean, heavy metal is really getting a bad rap here. It's, uh, it might just be reserved for a more mature, sophisticated <laughs> listener. It's an acquired taste, heavy yeah. metal music. <laughs> But I just think that, like, from classical music to heavy metal music is quite a contrast in many ways. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something in between that's better suited. It's quite a temporal contrast, too, when you think about it. Absolutely. Orchestra and string quartet and piano and things like that versus distorted guitars and drum kits and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a 2012 study. Uh, but way more recently, a newer study out of the University of Glasgow, Scotland, for the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, suggests reggae and soft rock are where it's at. <laughs> Shelter dogs were exposed for six hours at a time to several different genres of music, classical, soft rock, reggae, pop, and uh -huh. Motown. Right? Uh -huh. During these intervals, they would measure stress indicators such as heart rate, cortisol levels, and anxiety-based behaviors and movements. Are they barking? Are they laying down and smiling? You know right, what I mean? Right, yeah. And I th it sounds like they had them hooked up or they were taking blood tests. As yeah. how else do you, rep, you know, get cortisol levels? Yeah, I'd imagine you'd want a control group that, that was listening to no music just to, mon just to, you know, compare, you know, the normal ups and downs of cortisol levels and things like that, you mm. know, to, to... Absolutely. But I don't know, I didn't do the study, so... <laughs> but that's the scientific way. Mm. But again, Bob Marley for the win, right? <laughs> Motown, not so much. Really? Yeah, Motown, not so much. There was no mention of heavy metal in this... Uh, latter study, right? Okay, yeah. In the former study, on the seventh day of classical music, the dogs began to return to normal behavior, leading the researchers of the latter study to wonder if they were simply getting habituated or bored you know, right, yeah. with that genre of music. Right, yeah. So, you know, maybe mix it up a little for Fido. Stay away from the psycho stuff unless you want a Cujo. Yeah, uh, that, that, I don't know, that suggests to me that maybe what they were responding to to begin with was new stimuli in their environment. Mm. More so than the music themselves, you know, because if they get, if they have a response initially and then that response kind of dies down as it becomes more of a normal thing, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're just responding to that stimuli. Maybe they're not really responding to music, you know. Maybe, you know, any new stimuli could have, could have yielded similar results. You know, for a quick little side note, it's cool the way dogs all howl in unison. Yep. And in this neighborhood, we live kind of close to one of the main roads, and anytime you have an emergency vehicle going by, yeah, all the neighborhood dogs will howl, we'll howl with the emergency <laughs> vehicle. It's got this kind of ra – actually, the, the emergency vehicles have a similar raising and falling pitch. Right, yeah, you know? yeah. But they'll all, they'll, all, they'll all do – and the wolves in the woods, they'll all do this together, mm -hmm. and it's, there's something going on. I mean, it's communication, yeah. I guess. It's here I am, here, where are you kind of thing. Yeah, it's mimicry at least. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, in the case of the uh, siren yeah, going yeah. by, for sure. But I just think it's pretty pretty cool um, how dogs, <laughs> they're singing. <laughs> I mean, you've seen videos of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And then, like, uh, there's another thing where you can dance with your dog. They'll be, they'll jump up on the two hind feet, and you jump up, and they jump up with you. And it looks oh, like, sure. It looks like you're dancing, but yeah. they're really just kind of wanting to jump, and I, I don't know how that all works. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I saw a thing once on the intelligence of dogs, and the main takeaway from this show was, anyway, that dogs are very, very, do very, very well when they have you to take their cues from, mm -hmm. right? And when you're not around to give them cues, uh, not as much, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, but... Uh, but, but, they're, they're, but, you know, when they think you want them to jump up on their hind legs, you know... Oh, they yeah. will totally do that. Yeah, you're probably not going to see a lot of house video where no, the owner's not there and the dog just decides just to decides to stand up and spontaneously dance. Get yeah, funky no. in the in the in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get a different kind of funky in the living room. <laughs> but that's dogs. Yep. Uh, let's talk about cats here. Oh wow! I have a cat. My favorite animal. You're a cat person. I'm a cat person. Yeah. Me too. It seems. I mean, I love all of God's little creatures. But, for sure, uh, but yeah. I tend to get along with cats better for some reason. <laughs> you know, while cats show little interest in human music, a clever trio has cracked at least some kind of cat music code. Little interest in humans sometimes. Little interest in humans too. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> University of Wisconsin-Madison psychologist Charles Snowden, University of Maryland composer David T.A., and PhD student at SUNY Binghamton, Meredith Savage, have developed a compositional style based on the frequencies and tempos that cats normally communicate on. Interesting. 
So um, after David T.A. wrote a few compositions, Snowden and Savage brought it to 47 different homes where cats were present. They would play two selections of classical music and then two selections of T.A.'s compositions. And when presented with the latter, the cats were more likely to approach and in some cases rub up against the speaker. Mm. So they seem to, and this also seemed to affect older and younger cats much more than it did middle-aged cats. Hmm. You wonder about that? Yeah. Listening to these songs, um, you'll hear like a lot of, um, he's a cellist, so he's using uh-huh. his cello a lot. Yeah. But he's a sweeping kind of rising and falling meow kind of sounds. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's also kind of like shaker sound which is kind of in the rhythm of cat scratching itself. Yeah. And then also sounds that are the rhythm of what I think is a cat cleaning itself. Like, yeah. or, or also the, you know, the, the uh, food bag. Did you ever like take the, did you ever like have the dry cat food? <laughs> shaking and, and that shake, can? Sh- sh- oh and boy. And they would come running, right? Yeah, yeah, don't you know? Don't they know? <laughs> Didn't you write a piece from the perspective of your cat I back in college? I absolutely did. Yeah. I absolutely did. And uh, I actually recorded a can of, of uh, pounce treats and made it at a part of it and actually got one of uh deborah helms was one of our fellow students who made a generating like a, a purr she actually created a purr sound from uh, yeah. synth synthesis for nice. a synthesis nice and it sounded pretty pretty close so i was able to use that purr sound and i don't know if that's what this person did or if uh if he actually recorded the sound of a cat purring who knows it was very interesting i, th- I imagine the, the sound of a cat purring would be very hard to record You'd be I mean, it, depends, it would depend on the purr, wouldn't it? I mean, a good loud one probably you get at it. You'll I get can, something. I can record biscuits purrs from ten feet away. I'm sure of it. <laughs> it depends on your cat. <laughs> I mean, like I said, my cat. When I played this for Uncle Biscuits, yeah. she gave zero meows. Yeah, of course. Although she seemed at peace, she wasn't like leaving the room or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, regarding my cat, Uncle Biscuits, this is a little bit embarrassing. But when she comes up and looks up at me and meows. And I point her to the food bowl, which is completely full. And I go and open up the door. She doesn't want to go out. That she's, she's just saying, hey, punk, pick me up and snuggle me. So lately I've gotten to a thing where I'll pick her up and I'll put on my Bluetooth speaker. And I'll, sing, I'll play a mellow song. And I'll sing along with the song while holding her so she feels my chest vibrations. Yeah. And she doesn't want that to end. She hugs me. She keeps purring the whole time. And when nice. it's time to put her down, she's like, no. No. <laughs> So I don't know if she's just digging the music or just digging being close to me and feeling the vibrations from my chest against her. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you know, with all of these examples, you know, uh, some uh, something that keeps sticking in my brain is, okay, we know these animals can respond to auditory stimuli. Mm-hmm. You know, is it is it music specifically that they're responding to? Mm-hmm. Or are they just responding to new sounds introduced in their environment? Mm-hmm. You know, Um and it's, it's it's a real sticking point. It's, it's impossible to know what's going on in their brains, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a really tough question to answer. Oh, maybe next time I'll try and sing like a major second off of the melody and see if, and she, see if she sings out of tune. Or a minor second and see if she jumps yeah. away and gets out of there. Much as I hate to keep going back to it, my basset hound that hated my violin playing. You know, I, I can't help it. It's like, you know, if I was a better violinist, would, you know. Or is it just that high frequency thing that she liked to howl along to, kind of like the the, sir- the sirens of the emergency vehicles or something? You know, who knows? Which is something to it. There's like a mimicry thing going on there. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, um, I will go ahead and say that if you're curious about this, uh, the the composer David T A spelled David D A V I D, uh, T E I E. You can okay. find his music on uh, Spotify or uh, iTunes. There's a album called Music for Cats Album One. And he also did another one we're going to talk about later on with monkeys. He did this same thing for monkeys. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But before we get into monkeys, let's talk about some cows. Let's talk about some cows. Let's talk about our bovine buddies. Yeah. You know, there's videos abound of people oh, sure. capturing the attention of cows with their instruments. Right. Uh, Matt, have you seen any of these? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, be it like a little girl with a flute playing Mary Had a Little Lamb for one or two cows. Yeah, yeah. Or be it a jazz trombonist wooing an entire herd. Yeah, yep. Uh, you play, they come check it out. That's just how it goes with the cows. <laughs> Pretty much. This Florida dairy farmer, uh, Ed Henderson, says that cows have an ability to understand what's threatening and what's pleasing, and music is definitely pleasing to them. Okay, yeah. Ed plays the trombone for his cows. Ed may have at some point become aware that he and his business might actually benefit from this practice. 
In 2001, a research group at the University of Leicester in the UK, led by Dr. Adrian North and Liam McKenzie, played a number of different genres and tempos for cows while in the milking sheds. Uh, this study involved over a thousand cows. Mm. And groups of these cows were exposed to fast music, slow music, and no music uh, from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. during a nine-week period. Okay. Those that were exposed to slow, calming music were producing 3% more milk per day compared to the others. On average? On average, yeah. Their theory is that cows have an increased yields with lower stress levels. Right. And that this music is aiding in this effort. That makes sense. The farmers seem to agree. I don't think they had EKGs on all these cows, right? <laughs> but if you know any, not. if you know any farmers, you know they know their animals. Absolutely. And uh, they got an intuition about these things, right? I, I just can't, can't challenge that. Uh, no. But for me, for some reason, the cows of all these videos with people playing music for animals, it's just so interesting the way they just. The cows seem really into it. They'll they'll gather. They'll they'll just yeah. one, one will come up and then the whole thing will come. Next thing you know, you got a whole. I'm gonna try it one day. I'm gonna go out there and. Play some music for some. Yeah, it's just, again, it's just so something. impossible to know what's going on in their heads. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, um, you know, do they really quote unquote like it? You know, uh, are they are they just responding to stimuli? You know, I mean, there's there's so much. Without the music, they 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 produce more with the classical music. And actually, it wasn't all classical music. It was also mellow, kind of soft rock. I think they did yeah. like "Everybody Hurts" by REM, right? Yeah, and some more mellow, just soft rock kind of. Stuff, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's maybe it's more about tempo. I don't know. I I don't know. Um, hmm. I don't think it's really very easy to know. It isn't. No, but you it's know. cool that people are trying to find out. Yeah, you could you could see how they respond to something with a slow tempo, but but a very different musical character. You know, some you know something like grunge core or something that has you know mm-hmm. still a slow but lots of distortion and. Hmm. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I think I. I'm inclined to think that timbre has something to do with it. Yeah. I'm inclined to think that tempo has something to do with it. Mm. I don't know about dissonance and consonance as much. Uh, well, you know, dissonance and consonance, as we understand them in, in right. tonal harmony, is a, is a construct anyway. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I mean, we, we sort of decided these for ourselves, you know. Yeah. Or Bach decided for us. Yeah. But still, not just Bach. It was, it was, but, but yeah. But they were, they were decided before. Uh, you know, this is something we inherited from our musical culture. Um, yes, there, have, there have definitely been people who have attempted to demonstrate the, the, you know, what we consider a high dissonance level, like a minor second or a tritone or something, is doing something fundamental to our brains, or that we are hardwired in some way to to find these displeasing and they, they've really kind of come up short Mm -hmm. in, in understand, in, in doing this. So, but I think that we can, we can all agree that the octave and the perfect fifth are universally pleasing for the most part. Well, those things exist in, in perfect frequency ratios, right? The octave is a two to one frequency ratio Mm -hmm. and the perfect fifth is a, uh, two to three, I think two to three. Yeah. There you go. Uh, ratio. So, so the, uh, the, these things are, are, uh, natural frequency kind of things mm-hmm. that we think of as is pleasing, but again, you know, we think of uh, we think of that as pleasing. It's that's largely cultural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's um, there's a there's a culture um, the the there's a culture in in the mountains of, of Bosnia. Yes, that, yeah, that's the well, one. I've... I, I've been on this before, right? Okay, yeah, no, go where, ahead, go where, ahead. Where they, where they sing in the major seconds, right? Yeah. And they love that. Yeah. They love that harmony. Yeah. yeah. I've heard it. It actually sounds pretty cool. Actually sounds kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't do it justice there, Matt. I <laughs> see. <laughs> An actual musician. I'm not a pianist. But... <laughs> W-W-A-M-D. What would an actual musician what do? What would an actual musician do? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All Ho- right. Hope you guys are looking forward to three more years of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's move on, shall we? We yeah. digress. We digress a lot. Um. So yeah, we were talking about that video with Coco, the the ape and flea mm-hmm. and flea, and uh, m- monkeys are probably one of the more studied, more widely studied. They're uh, considered very biologically close to us, so mm-hmm. they get studied a lot. Yeah, was well, it maybe one or one one or two chromosomes mis- difference or difference, something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, 
what a difference that makes. I know. Or does it? Or does it? Uh, <laughs> now, the tamarind monkey and the marmosets have been used um, in previous studies to determine primate responses to the various aspects of music. Hmm. In 2006, a study run by Josh McDermott and Mark D. Hauser, both participating species consisted of primates born and raised in a lab with no music exposure. I okay. Mean, and if they're born in the jungle, do they have music exposure? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that also means no other howling monkeys howling in the trees. Monkeys, yeah, right. From afar. It turns out that when it comes to background noise in general, they prefer softer sounds over louder sounds. Yeah. The way they did this was they used white noise at 60 dB and then 90 dB. Mm-hmm. And I guess they're measuring their vitals while they're doing this. Yeah. And then when it came to tempo, they seemed to prefer the slower lullaby tempo like over techno stuff. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? That seems to be kind of a universal thing here. <laughs> tempos. Slow tempos, yeah. Uh, except for us humans. Except for us humans, apparently. This applied to actual music and then also just a simple metronome where both species seem to prefer the 60 BPM click over the 400 BPM click. Well, I would too, frankly. <laughs> Can you imagine? And like I said, they didn't seem to show any interest in consonants or dissonance, unlike we humans. Mm. And also, unlike we humans, they seem to prefer silence over, you know, even the most relaxing of lullabies. Wow. So uh, silence is where it's at for the monkeys. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what they were. That's what they grew up in, right? In a laboratory environment. Yeah. Yeah, they had to be real careful not to play any music in that lab, I guess. That would have ruined the whole, somebody comes in. Yeah, you could just see somebody, yeah, so, some, some you know, graduate assistant comes in, you know, and then, you know, puts some music on his iPhone and <laughs> yeah, ruins the whole thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, tempo and volume are key players here. You know, and McDermott and Hauser wonder if this has to do with those also being associated with stressful events in nature, mm-hmm. such as storms, altercations, and fleeing from predators. Right. We talked about that on the, when we were talking about rats, like, yeah. do, 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 right. you're yeah, running. Yeah. So these are faster tempos. These are stress, high stress situations. Right. I thought the storms was interesting. Yeah. Um, but I can see that, you know. Uh, the alert cries of both Marmoset and the Tamarind involve short broadband bursts repeated at high rates. Mm. So back to David T.A. His compositions based on the calming sounds um, had just that effect on monkeys. Right. Yeah. And then likewise, um, the ones that were based on the more alarming sounds caused irritation among the monkey listening audience. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. And then finally, Andrea Ravignani and his colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics Psycholinguistics. studied several recordings of white-handed gibbons whooping in their natural environments. Okay. They noticed very constant rhythm patterns within these whoops. Mm -hmm. So they're holding a groove of sorts, you know, whooping together. Yeah. And then they also noticed that the male and female monkeys would call back and forth eventually and eventually sync up their calls with impressive precision. Mm -hmm. So... One has a song, the other one starts jiving with it, and they begin to sing it together. Hmm. We do this at rock concerts, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Are we so different? No. No, we're not. So I just uh, think that's interesting. Frighteningly close. Frighteningly close. Yeah. So um, some of these scientists suggest a majority of these musical occurrences in nature are purely for purposes of mate selection and procreation or warnings or greetings. Yeah. Right? Dr. Jeremy has a theory. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. Um, well, like all communication is output input, right? Mm -hmm. Transmission reception. We convey things like back off or come a little closer. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, do you want to be in my crew? Cool. This is where we hunt. This is where the danger is. This is right, where we paint yeah. on our caves. Yep. Uh, eventually, basic grunts and other sound transmissions become music and song as our species evolved. Yeah. So we do make music to entertain each other. We do make music to attract each other. Are we that different, really? Are we that different? And to relate to each other. It makes me wonder where, yeah, because you know, bringing it back to Darwin from the beginning, mm -hmm. where, yeah, where on the evolutionary scale is musical appreciation? Yeah, or, or sort of like, you know, like that, that line from Isaac Asimov, when does a... When does a difference engine become a search for truth? You know, mm -hmm. when does, uh, you know, when does a set of communications, uh, you know, designed to keep you away from predators and let you know where the food is, when does that become 
an aesthetic expression, an artistic expression. Because mm-hmm. that's the because when we think of music, you know, uh, and the way humans perceive it, it is art. Yeah. Right. So, so what is art then? What is you know that that aesthetic expression? At what point does are we no longer simply you know trying to warn each other or attract mates, but are you know are it, it, are doing something purely for the pleasure of it? Mm-hmm. You know, and at what point along the evolutionary scale does does that happen? And, and why did we do that? You know, I mean, th- these really kind of go to fundamental questions about who we are. Mm-hmm. Well, that I'm not necessarily prepared to answer. <laughs> no, we can, but, we can speculate away, though. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I think back to the ancient uh, music episode we did when we were kind of talking about why men might have actually come up with music. Yeah. You know? And it kind of started out, right, as, you know... Um, the same yeah, stuff we're talking about. Yeah, the animal we're trying to hunt headed that way. Go go head it off, right? And and then it got more complex. They would coordinate, hey, I'm going to go up in this tree and hoot. And then right, yeah. And jump out and snare this little dude you know rabbit you know yeah or, yeah yeah or saber tooth tiger yeah and and it, yeah and at what point does that become doing it for the pleasure of, when when did it become a means to an end when when did it become or or not a means to an end when did it become a mean unto itself right when you you now you know you're not doing it for for a, for a for the purpose of survival like that anymore you're doing it just for the sake of doing it you know we mentioned whales and i've definitely heard that, that some whales will sing just just for the enjoyment of of singing mm-hmm. right yeah you know, at, at what point are, are you know because it feels like at that point when you're doing it for the sake of itself then you're starting to take a step towards it being music not just not just auditory communication but but music right it's becoming an art it's becoming an aesthetic i'm going to speculate that it's already happening in, in the animal kingdom in the animal kingdom yeah, because uh, what makes the difference? Wh- why why y- you're listening to music? One one thing you listen to gives you stress. The other one lowers your stress levels. Yeah. <laughs> do you appreciate this? The the one that lowers your stress levels more? A lot uh, of people might say it's better for you. Do the are the animals aware of this? Does the cow know? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I mean I, the cow doesn't know that. The cow just feels stressed or not, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how aware, you know, I mean, now you're getting into how aware is a cow of its own emotions and, you know. uh, (laughs) Well, we use music. Are we qualified for that question? Not at all. But we use music, we use music to alter our minds to a degree. I mean, to amp us up, to relax us. Yeah. I mean, we have the advantage. I suppose this is a unique advantage. Maybe not. But we we definitely have have the advantage of being able to intellectually understand that this music is coming from a speaker you know there's no there's, there's no reason to be stressed simply because we're hearing this we understand it's mm. creation we know what a you know we we, we know what spotify is right we, <laughs> we 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 have the advantage uh, of being able to sort of intellectually disassociate and know there's no danger that it's just coming from here mm-hmm. right um so you know if, if we know that may, you know maybe we can appreciate heavy metal, even though, you know, on an animal level, that would be stressful to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, On on a human level, we know that, you know, this is just, you know, and then we can explore emotions this way, Mm -hmm. right? You know. Well, if you believe in evolution. um, And I do. And I I do personally, personally, I do. I do think that we came from a species that was not human, that didn't probably play or know music. Right. Right. So who's to say over the next thousands of years or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what'll happen? I guess my point is, who's to say that this phenomenon can occur outside of our species? You know, we just know so little, and you know, so many of of our presumptions about our own superior intelligence uh, via the animal kingdom is really kind of come under question in recent years when we've taken closer looks at it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that you know who. Who's to say they don't respond to music in some way, or at least not don't at least have the potentiality to one day respond to music in a way that is very similar to the way we do, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe even make sounds in a musical fashion, and even make sounds for the sake of making sounds, which is as good a definition of music as any I have. Oh, I agree. I agree. Hmm. Anyways, so 
This is probably a good place to close it down, huh? Probably, yeah. It's not going to get much better than that one. <laughs> like I said, man, there's so much more. Like, Birdsong can be its own episode, right? Uh, yeah, and, and may well be. It may well be. But there's also, I mean, there's also, we, we covered ocean life, cats, dogs, monkeys, and cattle. You yeah, know? yeah. There's bats, there's rats, like we talked about, rodents, yep. elephants. Yep. Reptiles, Matt. I'm not really too optimistic about the reptiles. Not really too I, optimistic about the reptiles. Well, they're generally considered having an older style brain, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to research that, and we'll we'll come up with something. We'll let you know what we come up with. I can't wait. This is fascinating. <laughs> for my research for this episode, I um, I read a few good articles that I'd like to, and we'll put this on the website too. We'll put links to this up on the website. Okay. Yeah. But I'd to go ahead and go and let you guys know about. Uh, one of them is uh, Seven Scientific Studies About How Animals React to Music mm. by Meredith Danko on mentalfloss.com. Mm. Do Goldfish Prefer Bach or Stravinsky <laughs> by Douglas Maine on Live Science. I'm sorry, probably LiveScience.com. Right. L-I-V-E. And then there's um, Is Music an Exclusively Human Thing? A New Study Says No <laughs> by Gabe O'Connor and Christopher Intagliata on NPR.org. And the ocean is so noisy, whales are starting to talk on a new frequency by Avery Thompson on popularmechanics.com. All right. Awesome. So we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Indeed. It's not theory. It's not ear training, but it's interesting to me. Uh, and we'll get back to teaching you human music just soon enough. We do plenty of special topics that I enjoy, and I think this is a good one. And I know there's a lot of animal people and animal lovers in our listening audience. So Indeed. I hope they enjoyed this. Indeed. And a uh, little, little brain relaxer to start the video. Here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll get into more music uh, in coming episodes. Take care. We hope you enjoyed that discussion. There's so much more to cover. So keep on listening. And tell a friend about us. For ways to support us financially, click the donate page on our website, musicstudent101.com. You can find our merchandise on redbubble.com slash musicstudent101. And for questions or comments, you can always reach us at info at musicstudent101.com.